Hey there, and welcome to my tutorial on HeroScape. In case you're entirely unfamiliar with the game, HeroScape is a competitive board game with cool modular 3D terrain in which players control armies consisting of neat miniature figures that come from a historical, sci-fi, or fantasy setting, and they'll battle each other mostly by rolling dice. The game is of light to medium complexity, it's open to players of all ages and skill levels, and it's recommended to be played in the vicinity of a large amount of snacks. So let's have a look at how you play HeroScape starting with the army cards that accompany the figures and they'll look like this on the left you'll see the cards that i personally prefer to use that i've designed myself and you can find for free online the links in the description on the right you'll see the hexagonal cards that came with the original game but that take up too much space in my opinion for most of this video i'm going to use the cards on the left and we'll have a look now at the information that they provide as you can see they offer a picture of the figure they include the name they include the faction to which they belong, which corresponds to the color scheme of the card and the five stats that the figure has going into battle. Each figure has a certain amount of points for life, which reaches zero and then your figure dies. It has movement points, which is the amount of spaces that you can move in one action. It has a range value, which is the amount of distance away that you can attack. It has an attack value, which is the amount of attack dice you can roll in an attack and defense, which is the amount of defense dice that you can roll to defend. Note here that my cards have a different symbol for figures that can fly. They have a wing versus figures that cannot fly who have a shoe. This is a shorthand for the flying special power, which is printed in full on the original cards and which will be discussed in more detail later. So flying is a special power and special powers are printed in full text on the cards. Note that some of the special powers, such as Memring's Fireline, are labeled as special attacks, which is a specific type of special power that is worth paying attention to. Next, we'll find the figure's properties. Each figure belongs to a species, a type, and a class, and it has a personality, a size, and a height. We'll discuss all of these in more detail later, but for now we're going to take a quick look at the types of figures that you might find in HeroScape. The Common Squad, the Unique Squad, the Common Hero, the Uncommon Hero, and Unique Hero. The slide provides more detail here, but in a nutshell, squads have multiple figures per card, while heroes are just one figure per card. Common and Uncommon cards can have multiple copies in the same player army, while Unique cards can only have one copy per player's army. And those are the different types of cards. You can pause here and have a look in more detail if you like, but we're gonna move on for now and discuss the point value that's on each card. This is basically to balance out your army as each card has this value and the higher the value, the stronger the card is. As players build armies that have the same amount of total points in general, this point system allows you to have fair battles to one another or battles that are at least somewhat fair. Finally, Every card has this little diagram of the figure on it as well. And this diagram is used to indicate where a figure can be hit by the enemy and where the eyes of the figure are located. The red and green parts are vulnerable and can be attacked, but the green area are the eyes of your character usually, and they are the starting point that is used to determine line of sight to your enemies when you are making a ranged attack on them. More specifically, the rule states if you can draw a straight line from the green spot of your figure to any red spot on your enemy's figure, they are in your line of sight and you can potentially target them with a ranged attack. I'll discuss it in more detail later, but just for now, here are some fun line of sight examples because our dragon figure is vulnerable across its entire figure, but there are many figures that aren't. For instance, figures that hold shields have those shields protect their body and zombies actually require headshots to be attacked from range. Okay, so now we know how to read these HeroScape cards. Let's take a look at what a round of play in HeroScape actually looks like. And before you get started, you'll note that every player will have the following components. There are the army cards that we've already discussed that correspond to the figures in your army, but you'll also get a 20-sided initiative die and four order markers, which will look a little bit different in real life. But for the sake of simplicity, I made them look a little bit more 2D on the slide. They have the numbers one through three and an X printed on them. You're gonna use these to put them on the army cards to indicate the order in which you're gonna activate them with one going first and three going last, but I'll show you all about that in just a second. That initiative die, that D20, will be rolled at the start of a round to determine which player resolves their number one order marker first with highest initiative winning the roll. So let's look at what that looks like by playing through a round real quick. 
So to start your round, you're first going to place your order markers like so. As you can see, one card can have multiple order markers on it. Once that's done, we're going to roll for initiative. In this case, player one rolled a one and player two rolled a 17. So player two won initiative because it's the higher roll and they'll get to go first. And they're going to reveal their first order marker, which happens to be on Sergeant Drake Alexander in this case. So in this case, player two gets to take a turn with Sergeant Drake Alexander, after which player one gets to reveal their first order marker, which happens to be on Nagoksa. In this case, player one gets to take a turn with Nagoksa, and when they are done, player two now reveals their second order marker. And this will continue until all three order markers for both players have been revealed, after which you have to show that your final order marker was indeed the X and you weren't hiding another one, two, or three to cheat. <laughs> so anyways, that's what you do, and then you're going to check for the end of round effects. And once you've done that, you're going to update the round tracker if you are playing a battle that requires you to track the amount of rounds, after which the next round will begin unless time has run out or one side has met one of the victory conditions. Great. So how do you take a turn with one of your figures then? Well, let's discuss the turn structure for a quick second. And your turn will consist out of four actions that are going to take place in a very specific order. First, like we already said, you're going to reveal your order marker. And in this case, keep in mind, if all the figures that are associated with a specific army card are off the battlefield and they've been destroyed, then your turn will be lost. So be very careful putting down order markers on figures that might die soon. Second, if you still have figures left on a card that you just had an order marker revealed on, you get to activate them. Now, here is something you have to keep in mind with common squads. When you have common squads, you can have multiples of them in your army. And if it's a squad, it might have multiple figures. So in this case, a Marden Nagrub card will give you three figures of Marden Nagrubs. And you can have multiples in your army. So if you have two of these cards, you'll have six of these figures. When you are going to activate your Marden Nagrub card, you get the big three of them because there's three listed on a single card. It doesn't have to be corresponding to the card that added them to the battlefield. For this, a lot of people will just stack their common army cards on top of each other because basically one card can be used to activate all the figures with the same name. This is different, however, when you're playing with heroes or unique army cards. So just keep in mind that in that case, you do have to make sure that your hero is associated with a specific card. All right, so moving on from that, we get to move any of our activated figures. And you can decide to not move any of your figures and just leave them in a space, but you do have to move them one at a time. Once we've completed movement for all our activated figures, we get to attack with them. Again, you can decide not to attack. The important thing to remember here is that you cannot mix and match these turns. The orders are very specific, so you cannot move, attack, then move again. You can also only use the figures in step three and four that have been activated in step two. So the figures that are going to be moving are also going to be the figures that are going to be attacking and vice versa. So with that, you now know how to play around and how to play a turn. Let's discuss movement and attacking. We'll start with moving. Movement in HeroScape is pretty straightforward. You get to move up to one hex per move point that you have. So in this case, Sergeant Drake Alexander has a move value of five, which means that he gets to move five hexes, like shown in the visual right now. There are some exceptions to this, though. We have this very cool 3D terrain, so terrain is going to influence our movement quite a lot. When moving to higher ground, you have to count the side of each level that you're going up as one space as well. So for Drake to get up on the top of that, he's going to have to use entire movement counting the sides of the levels that he goes up, which gets him up to five to get there. Great. When you're descending, you don't have to do this, though. You can just jump off for one movement, which is awesome. But there is a little bit more to it, because in real life, when you're moving, if you're really big, you can take much bigger strides. So how does that work in HeroScape? Well, every character can only climb up levels to their height minus one. So in this case, Drake has a height of five. So that means that he cannot get on top of a stack of five tiles because he can't climb it directly. He's too small for that. And he's going to have to use the tile next to it. And then the next turn, 
to actually get up there. Going down again, the height comes into play as well. If you are going to drop down from a tower that is equal to or greater than your height, Jumping off or falling off will require you to roll for fall damage, and you do this by rolling a single battle die. We'll explain this later, but basically for every skull that you roll for fall damage, you're going to get one wound. Moving on, let's look at the obstacles that you might find in the battlefield that you are playing. In general, all the obstacles that you face are to be avoided as you are seeing right now. However, if your figure is as tall as an obstacle and you have enough height to cover all its levels, you can kind of scale it. Now for ruins, like on the previous visual, that's unlikely to ever happen. But for smaller obstacles like a bridge wall, which we're seeing here, that has an outside height of three, that's definitely an option. Drake would actually even have a movement point left after scaling this bridge wall. Great, so what about figures? Well. Uh, if they are in your opponent's army, then they are enemies, and you can't move through them, you'll just have to walk around them. However, when you are dealing with figures that are in your army, they are friendly, and there is an exception. You can just walk through them unless they are engaged to an enemy figure. Now, engagement is something I'll explain later, but for now, let's just say that it means that an enemy figure is adjacent to your friendly figure, as shown in the visual. That means that they're engaged, and you're gonna have to move around them because you don't wanna get in between them while they're fighting, right? So those are the basics for movement, but you might have noticed that HeroScape has some really cool big figures with double spaced bases. How do you move those around? Well, thankfully, the rules are pretty much the same. All you have to do is pick a leading and a following end before you move them, like so. The lead will go first and the following end will go in whatever space the leading end was before you moved it. Now this example has a very clear path, but sometimes you have to weave your way through a bunch of obstacles and your movement might require a little bit more complexity to it. And there's a little thing that you can do in HeroScape which is called a lead flip. So you can flip the lead and the following part of your base whenever you like for free. It, it doesn't even cost a movement point. I'll show you an example starting with the lead where it was on the previous slide and I'll move in the same way that we did earlier and again and at this point I would like to move back backing up a little bit so I am going to flip my lead and now my hind leg is actually going to be the leading part of my base and my front leg is going to have to move where the hind leg currently is like so. I'm going to move again like that backing the T-Rex up, and here I decide I want to do another lead flip. So I'm declaring a lead flip to my opponent, and now my front leg is going to be leading again, which means that the hind leg is going to have to move in the space where the front leg originally was. When you're doing this, just make sure that you clearly state to your opponent when you're flipping your leads, because this can get confusing to them really quickly. Okay, so how does terrain work with all of this? Well, it's pretty much the same as it works for single base figures. You just have to make sure that you end your bases at the same level. You can have your base at different levels while you're moving, but the end always has to be at the same level. So Grimnak on his T-Rex can get up there as long as he's ending at the same level. In this specific scenario that worked, but that also means that if the ground would have looked like this, there is no way for Grimnak to end in that spot growing straight. So he'll have to walk around the terrain. And this can seriously hinder movement for double spaced figures. And it's a really fun part of Hero Escape. There are other ways in which terrain can hinder your movement too, even if you're a single base figure. Take this scenario for example. If Sergeant Drake Alexander moves in here, his gun is barely above the terrain, so he can fit there nicely. However, if the terrain would be one level higher, the gun has no room to fit there anymore. So we would have to flip our character like so if we wanted to fit him in there. Thankfully, in HeroScape, you can rotate your figures to your heart's desire while you're moving them, but this is something to keep in mind. Your figures always have to fit within the terrain that you're spacing them, and that's one way terrain will influence the game. But there are many other different types of terrain that will influence movement as well, the most important one being water. Water has zero height, and single-spaced figures must stop their movement when they're entering water. Getting out of water again does not influence movement. When you have a double spaced figure though, you have to stop only when both spaces of your double spaced base are in the water at the same time. 
The other types of terrain also have effects. You can pause the video if you want to have a look at them, but I'll typically provide a terrain overview so that you can reference them whenever you're playing a battlefield that actually uses them, because aside from water, they're not as common. Other features of Heroescape that can influence terrain are glyphs. Glyphs are special tiles that will stop your movement when you reach them, after which you have to flip it face up if it wasn't already, and then you get to resolve the powerful ability that's printed on it. And these are very good abilities that are often worth fighting for. Now, if you want to make movement a lot easier, you can also just avoid all of this by flying. If your figure has the flying special power, which is indicated by a wing instead of a shoe symbol on my custom cards, you can declare that your figure will start flying and ignore everything that we've discussed. You can just fly over water, over lava, over obstacles, over enemy figures, over height, and then just land. Note though that your figure can also decide to walk if they prefer to do so. This might seem counterintuitive, but this can actually be very useful whenever you're engaged to an enemy figure because flying will break engagement and will lead to issues. All right, so that is pretty much everything there is to say about movement. Let's have a look at attacking, which will happen after we have completed all our movement and only with the figures that were already activated in this turn. This is how it works. First, we declare who is going to be attacking and who we are attacking, or the defender. This is all decided by the attacking player. In this case, Sergeant Drake Alexander is going to attack Nagoxa. Great. Next, the attacker gets to roll dice equal to their figure's attack value with any modifiers. In this case, Sergeant Drake Alexander has an attack value of 6, so they get to roll 6 die. Next we are going to have the defender roll their defense die equal to the defense value with any modifier. In this case, that also coincidentally happens to be a six printed on Nagoxa's card. So Nagoxa also gets to roll six dice to defend from the attack. Once that is done, we're going to have to resolve it. And in this case, we get a successful attack whenever our attacker rolls more skulls then our defender rolls shields because the shields will block the skulls and the defender will take one wound for each unblocked skull. In this case, Sergeant Drake Alexander rolls four skulls, one shield and one blank, while Nagoxa rolled two skulls, two shields and two blanks, which means that Nagoxa will receive two wounds as two shields can only block two skulls. The wounds are then turned into wound markers that will go onto the army card of the defending character. In this case, Nagoxa gets two of them. When the figure's wound markers equal the life value, it will be destroyed, taken off of the battlefield, and placed onto the army card. Keep in mind, though, that your order markers that are on the army card stay there until the round is over, because there might be order markers that are still upcoming left, and as we already know, those will turn into lost turns. Great. So how does terrain influence all this? Well, you can get a height modifier. When your figure's base is on a higher level than the opposing figure base, you get to roll one extra die. So in this case, Nagoxa is one level higher than Sergeant Alexander Drake, so he will get one extra die when attacking or when defending. Now, if Nagoxa happens to be multiple levels higher, he still only gets one extra die when attacking or defending. The only time when you're going to get more than one extra die is when the base of the higher figure is 10 or more levels higher than the height of the lower figure, which is actually quite uncommon in Heroescape. However, when that happens, you get two extra dice, so you never count the amount of levels for additional dice. It's only one extra die for height or two extra if you have 10 extra levels, and that's it. Let's talk a little bit about range then. So to target a defender, its figure must be within the attacker's range. To illustrate that, I'm going to need a little bit bigger of a battleground and I'm going to need a character with range. Agent Carr here has a range of six on the card, which means that he can attack up to six tiles away, which means that the red area can all be attacked by Agent Carr. Nagoxa, on the other hand, has a range value of 1, so that means that he can only attack adjacent figures that are 1 hex away. That looks like this. We've also seen Grimnak earlier, who's also a character with a range of 1, and since he's a double space character, he can attack from either base 1 space away, which looks like this. 
Okay, so since these are ranged attacks, we've already discussed line of sight a little bit, which comes into play here. For ranged attacks, you need to be able to draw a clear line of sight that is uninterrupted between an attacking figure's green target point and the defender's red zone. We've already discussed this, but there's a little bit extra to it. When evaluating line of sight, you may only touch and adjust your own figures, including ones that were not activated, but you can only do this on your turn as well. This is important because sometimes your opponent is going to position their figures in a way that you don't have line of sight. So you can't mess with that. Your opponent did a very good job protecting their characters there. Furthermore, when you're having adjacent attacks, you don't have to worry about line of sight at all. When characters are adjacent, they can attack each other. Well, there are a couple of exceptions we'll discuss later, but in general, adjacent attacks do not require line of sight. Let's take a look at some example of this in play. So here we have a complicated map with Agent Carr and the Gox on the board. Can Agent Carr establish line of sight? How would we figure this out? Well, the best way to tell if a figure has line of sight is to get behind the head, literally physically move your own body, your face behind them, so you can look through their eyes and look at the targeted figure, like so. In this case, we can see Nagoxa's arm, and then we can verify the card to make sure that that's a red area, because it does look like some sort of armor. For Nagoxa, this is very much targetable, and Agent Carr has line of sight here. However, Heroescape does have a pretty quirky rule here that we have to take into account. For single space figures like Agent Carr, facing doesn't matter. You can move them around and rotate them as your heart's desire because they can rotate their neck and look behind them. However, for double spaced figures, facing does matter. In this case, certain areas of the body may block line of sight. For instance, here we have Major Q10, a double spaced figure whose head is in front of this massive torso and they can't just rotate their head in a way to look behind them. So. Unless you can draw a line from the target point to a figure behind them without being blocked by that torso, they can't look behind them. And to fix this as you're playing, you just have to be mindful of it as you're moving. Because you can flip a double-spaced figure during its move as much as you like. So if you keep your line inside in mind while you're moving, you might be able to position your characters in ways that are more optimal than others. Finally, there is one obstacle that influences line of sight, and that's the stone wall. A stone wall has red markers on top of them. There are actually five of them, and when your character is on a stone wall, in adjacent to one of these red markers, the red marker will actually function as your target point. So if you can draw line of sight from the red marker to an enemy figure, you will have line of sight. This is to accommodate for small characters looking over the stone wall trying to shoot at an enemy from range. Then there are jungle trees and bushes. When a small, medium or large figure is adjacent to at least one jungle tree or bush, they get one additional defense die when defending against a non-adjacent attack. So there's a lot of things to keep in mind here. If you have multiple jungle trees or multiple bushes, you still only get one extra die, even though they are present there as well. Similarly, when your enemy sneaks up on you and gets into an adjacent space, you do not get that additional die anymore because the attack is no longer ranged. So at this situation, Sergeant Drake Alexander will get the die. But what for a double-spaced figure or a huge figure? For a double-spaced figure, as long as one of the bases is next to a bush or a jungle tree, you get the extra die. However, huge figures are bigger than small, medium, or large figures, and they don't get the bonus because they're sticking out so much above the foliage. Finally, keep in mind that all of this applies to jungle trees and bushes, not to pine trees, which is a different tree altogether and just a prop, really. Anyways, we're done with ranged attacks here. Let's have a quick look at how special powers work. So as we already mentioned, some special powers are labeled as special attacks, which means that they function slightly differently. When it comes to attacking with a special attack, though, they are never modified in any way. So if you have height on your defending figure that you are attacking, you are not going to get those extra attack die. However, the defender that is defending against a special attack does get any relevant bonuses. So if Mimring is using their Fireline special attack on a defender that is higher than Mimring with their base, they do get actual defense dies, while Mimring does not get additional attack die. Some special powers refer to clear sight and not line of sight, which means that all parts of the figure, not just the red zone, 
are part of it as well. Even the gray parts are part of clear sight. Furthermore, many special powers only work against normal attacks. If this is the case, this will be printed on the card. And finally, when attacking multiple defenders, the attacker decides the order in which an attack takes place, unless the card specifies otherwise. And with that, we know almost all the rules of HeroScape. There's just one more thing to discuss, and that's engagement. So engagement happens when you have two figures that are enemies and that are adjacent. So in this case, we got Nagoxan, Sergeant Drake Alexander, and let's say that there are two different armies making them enemies. They are not adjacent though, so they're not engaged in this scenario. However, if we bring them up to each other, they are becoming adjacent. And since they're still enemies in different armies, they're now actively engaged. And this is very important because engaged figures can only attack the figures that they are engaged with, and when you leave engagement, you have to take a leaving engagement attack. So let's look at some examples here. For leaving engagement, if you move away from an engaged figure, you must roll a single attack die for a leaving engagement attack. So in this case, Sergeant Drake Alexander has to roll an attack die. He rolls a skull, so he will take one wound marker just for walking away from the engagement. Let's look at being engaged and how you can only attack one figure. In this case, it doesn't really matter that much because Sergeant Drake Alexander only has a range of one, so he wouldn't be able to attack anyone anyways. However, it does matter for characters that have a range greater than one as they can attack at a greater distance. For instance, if you remember Agent Carr from an earlier scenario, this is a character with a range of six. So he would be able to attack different enemies if he wasn't engaged to Nagoxa. Let's say in this scenario, Thorgrim is in the same army of Nagoxa and an enemy of Agent Carr. Usually he would be able to attack him, but since he's engaged to Nagoxa, he is prevented from attacking Thorgrim. He has to attack the adjacent engaged character in this case, Nagoxa. All right. So how does this influence movement though? Well, while you're engaged, you can move around an enemy figure without breaking your engagement. So this is absolutely doable without having to roll any engagement leaving attacks. However, if there is another enemy character, in this case, Thorgrim, and you en get engaged with them as well, like Sergeant Drake Alexander just did, it becomes trickier. Right now, Sergeant Drake Alexander cannot complete the circle around the Goxa without breaking engagement with Torgrim, which would force him to roll a engagement leaving die as well, which could lead to a wound as well. So in this case, he could, however, attack either because he's engaged with both. Now, there are some exceptions to engagement, and height is a big one. If a figure's base is on a level equal to or higher than the height of a figure below it, they are neither adjacent or engaged. So, in this case, Sergeant Drake Alexander still has a height of 5. Nagoxa is at a height of 0, so they are engaged and they are adjacent. If we bring Nagoxa up, though, to a level of 5, he's no longer adjacent, engaged or adjacent to Sergeant Drake Alexander. Obstacles bring some exceptions here as well. A ruin or a wall between two figures blocks adjacency unless it is lower than both figures' heights. So in this case, it's a ruin with a height of 6, which is higher than the height of Nagoxa, which is 5, and the height of Sergeant Drake Alexander, which is also 5. So they are not adjacent and they are not engaged either. However, if we replace Nagoxa with Grimnak, the scenario changes slightly because Grimnak has a height of 11, which means that his height is indeed higher than that of the ruin. However, since Sergeant Drake Alexander's height of 5 is still below it, there is no adjacency or engagement going on here as well. For characters to become adjacent and engaged, both of them need to scale the height of the obstacle, which would happen with Mimring another large character or a huge character even getting next to Grimnak. Great. But what about flyers? Well, when you start flying in HeroScape, you do break engagement. And that's why sometimes it's better to just walk around the character and not take that leaving engagement attack. When you do break engagement with a flyer, you do have to roll that die. But it's not always that big of a deal to take a leaving engagement attack. Half the time, you're going to roll a blank or a shield. And sometimes you'll just have the wound markers to deal with it. Anyways, let's discuss on how the game of HeroScape ends then and how you win. 
Usually you just do it by destroying your opponent's army entirely, but some scenarios will have special victory conditions that you can meet, or you might just run out of time or finish the last round and victory will go to the highest point total of the surviving army using the partial scoring system. How does that work? Pretty much you just calculate the value of each remaining figure and each remaining life point on the heroes and the total score, whoever has the highest points left will win the game. I'll show you an example of how I do that. So in this example, we have two Martin Nagrops left out of three and we have Nagoxa with two wound markers on them. How do we calculate the final score for this remaining army? Let's start with the Martin Nagrop. So all we have to do here is calculate the amount of points each of these Martin Nagrops is worth. So we can grab the total amount of army card points divided by the number of figures to figure out how much one of the figures is worth and then multiply it by the remaining figures. In this case, we divide the 35 by three because there's three original Martin Nagrops, which would leave us with about 11.6 for each individual Nagrop. When we divide it by two, we end up with around 23. So that's the value that our remaining Martin Nagrops are worth. For Nagoxa, unique hero, we want to calculate how much those wound markers are really worth. So we can get the entire amount of army card points divided by the life value to figure out how much a wound marker is worth, multiply that by the wound markers, and then subtract that from the total amount of points to see how much the life value that's still left is actually worth. So in this case, we would uh, calculate the wound marker value at 95 divided by five, the total amount of lives to get about 19 points on each wound marker. Multiplied by two, that means that we've taken about 38 points of damage. And when we subtract that from the total amount of points, we end up with 57. The final score for this army would therefore be 23 plus 57 equaling 80 points. And if this is more than our opponent's remaining score value, we win the game if the game ends early. And that's pretty much all there is to this tutorial. Now to wrap this up, I wanted to do a quick shout out to Trexy3D.com which is a 3D printing service that I've been using to get resin versions of out of print HeroScape figures. And I think they look pretty nice. So here you can see some of them on the pictures. I've speed painted these myself. I'm by no means a very good painter. These are all very easy to paint because HeroScape characters don't have that much detail. And as you can see, this is the quality that you would be get for it. So some of them are actual original HeroScape figures of the Microcorp agents in this case, and the other ones are printed by the 3D printing service. I think they look pretty darn close. Anyways, that is a tutorial. I hope it was helpful. Keep on scaping. Alrighty.